Hi, welcome to Light the Camera Author. I'm Jim Juno, and this is the podcast where we talk about uh, TV, movies, uh, entertainment, and anything that really catches our eye. And Barbara Butcher was early in her recovery from alcoholism when she found an unexpected lifeline, a job at the medical examiner's office in New York City. And she was the second woman ever hired for the role. You can see her right to the left of me here. Uh, in the death investigator in Manhattan, and she was the first to last more than more than last more than three months. Barbara, your new book is called "What the Dead Know: Learning About Life as a New York City Death Investigator." Welcome to Lights Camera Author. Oh, thanks so much, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. And we have your name in lights right behind me here, so Ooh. if you can notice it. <laughs> but this book. I started reading it about three days ago, and I reread it this morning. And you, you pull no punches to yourself. I mean, this is a gritty, this is a gritty memoir. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about the beginning. I mean, you're the very first chapter. You are at a crime scene uh, with a uh, with a person who had committed suicide, mm -hmm. um, but with an electrical cord, but that's not the entire story, is it? No, it certainly isn't. That was my first experience of um, a booby-trapped suicide or an angry suicide. <clears throat> Excuse me. What this guy did, well, first of all, let me say that I was working with my hand, my left hand in a cast. Stupid accident with a saw, cut a tendon, whatever. So I was kind of limited in what I could do, but I went to this suicide and a guy was hanging and the room was pitch black, pitch black. And the police officer said, I guess Con Ed turned off his electricity. So I was working with a flashlight in the dark and I did my usual examination. I had to prove this was a suicide, not a, a homicide or even an accident could happen. And, um, I was back in those days, I think this was in 1992 or 93, we were using Polaroid cameras with their big flashes. I took my pictures, I did my exam, and I, I went back to the office. Oh, well, I should mention the most important part. Um, normally, I would cut down a hanging victim. You hold onto the ligature with your left hand, cut through the cord, and then let them down easy. It's not, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but at least they don't go crashing to the ground. On this particular day, I couldn't do that because my hand was in a cast and I couldn't ask the police officer to do that, you know, union rules or whatever. So I called the office and said, when the morgue wagon gets here, could you ask them to cut the guy down easily and preserve the evidence on the ligature? And so I was looking at the pictures and organizing them, and I noticed something odd. Around his neck, the ligature was an orange uh, outdoor extension cord, nice and thick. And that's okay. And then on another picture, I saw that lit up by the flash, this cord was plugged into the wall. I thought, wait a second, that's weird. There's no electricity in the house. What sense does this make? Then it came to me. I called the police officer at the scene. I said, quick, go screw the light bulbs into the lamps. See if they're loose. And he did. And he's like, wow, they work. Electricity is on. Then I got it. This guy had rigged a booby trap. He made it appear as if there was no electricity. He plugged himself into the wall, hung himself, and then whoever cut him down would be electrocuted. Maybe killed, maybe just hurt badly, but that was the damnedest thing. I said, whoa, why would anybody want to do that? Um, you know, why not just kill yourself and be done with it? Why do you have to take somebody else with you? And then in time, I realized why that happens from my own personal experience. See, and that's the thing about this book is that it is it is your own experiences from from the start to the finish. And you talk about your time uh, when you were just beginning in the uh, well, let's let's back up one second here. Um, even when you were first beginning in the um, in the medical examiner's office with Dr. Kirsch, 
Hirsch. Hirsch, Hirsch, Hirsch. Hirsch. I'm sorry, Hirsch. Yeah. And um, he, uh, you said that it was a God shot mm -hmm. that enabled you to become a death investigator. That wasn't something you went to school for, was it? No, I was a physician assistant. I worked in uh, surgery for some years. Um, and then I, I got a master's in public health and I was a hospital administrator, a couple of different things. But um, unfortunately, I drank myself right out of some pretty good jobs. I was yeah. a heavy party girl. <laughs> See, and you don't shy away from that in the book. And that's what was really, uh, I admire you for that because, I mean, it's hard to actually admit that. And then was it hard to write about? You know, um, the alcoholism part, not really, because I'm extraordinarily proud of the fact that I've been sober for, oh, 32, 31, 32 years now, one day at a time. Now, back when I started uh, trying to get sober, <laughs> those days crawl by one day at a time. <laughs> um, but then something happened. I, I don't know. The a weight was lifted off me, maybe because I stopped poisoning myself with alcohol. And uh, then I started getting the benefits of sobriety, um, including this job as a death investigator, which led to a fantastic career um, beyond, they say in AA, that you will have a life beyond your wildest, wildest dreams. I certainly did. That's I saw amazing. things that were, it was incredible. Some of the cases that you were going on, um, again, I'm I'm sorry for that because I know I wouldn't make it. Um, that is, I mean, I read a lot of crime novels. I read Patricia Cornwell. Mm -hmm. uh, I read Kathy Reichs, um, mm -hmm. Karen Slaughter. I've all, you know, I've read all the crime novels. Um, Some of my favorites, yeah. Yeah, and um, but it's different when it's real, isn't it? Oh, there God, is no, yes. there's no quick solution like on TV where it's all wrapped up in an hour. Yeah, yeah. The T no TV procedurals. Forget that. That's another. That's mm -hmm. another level of um of uh theatric theatricality. Yeah, that's the word theatricality. But even in a book, um, you can describe very, very in a very granular way what you see and smell and hear and feel. But you can close the book when it starts to get to be too much. If you're at a scene where somebody is a double homicide, a mother and child, for instance, you can't say, oh, this is too much for me. You, yeah. you got to do your work. You have to get justice for these people, get answers for their families. It's a, it's a heavy responsibility. And I have to say that I enjoyed every second of it. It was fantastic work. You call it CSI syndrome, wanting mm. to uh, wanting to have it solved, all nice and tidy in one hour. Yeah, yeah. The procedurals, you know, they want to tie it up quick, make it very interesting. But unfortunately, what happens is that um, in in trials, jurors who've been watching police procedurals, they start to expect that this is real life, and you could get a case as simple as a. Uh, you know, a guy walks up to another guy in Times Square, yells, I'm going to kill you. And then he does, shoots him right in the head mm -hmm. in front of a, a, wit a witness pool of 20 people, 10 of them nuns, 10 of them priests. And, um, <laughs> they're all... and then you go to trial and all right, we have all these witnesses. We have the guy who said he was going to do it and he did it. And every all the ballistics match and a juror goes, uh, excuse me, what about the DNA? What DNA? What does DNA have to do with anything on this case? The DNA from the bullet that went through him? We already knew it went through him. So, <laughs> or, or, or they want satellite images, you know, zooming in on the uh, crime scene like you see on TV. Now, I have to admit, I do enjoy those shows once in a little while. It's like candy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> They may not be realistic, but they're an awful lot of fun. Seeing all those bright lights and machines and uh, technology and young, very attractive people, you know, all That's doing the work. Thing. Yeah, I mean, I think the only only uh, senior citizen on any of those shows is like Ducky from NCIS. Yes, exactly, you know? <laughs> exactly. They're all so good looking and dashing. I mean, 
Look, after a day of doing four or five cases, you know, homicides, suicides, accidents, I look like a wrung out mop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, but none of us ran around in stiletto heels and black cocktail dresses, believe me. Oh, no, it's not like that for in real life. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, let, let me walk that back just one second, because there were occasions when I was on call and I might be out at a cocktail party and I get, you know, they'd radio me and say, uh, there's a homicide in the 2-4 precinct. They need you right away. So I didn't go home to change. I'd go there in my dress and my uh, my nice high heels and the cops would be like, whoa, man, she's cool. But of course, I would put on a Tyvek suit and, you know, cover myself up. It happened a couple of times. What I also liked about your book was that you uh, you told about the interaction <clears throat> interaction between the uh, first responders and what you term or what they term uh, for death investigators, the last responders. Yes. Uh, I mean, yes. no disrespect <laughs> when I say that, but that's the term that some of them use. It certainly uh, is. I was a last responder. I come when it's too late to do anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't mind the term. I think it's used affectionately. Uh, but first responders, they have um, a duty to save lives. And so that, of course, is is premier. That's, that's the main thing. Um, but I did have a role in preventing deaths. In being a last responder, I get to go in there and see all the clues, examine everything and see what exactly happened. What can I give the police in the way of evidence that will help them to catch the perpetrator, therefore saving lives? And what answers can I give to a family that, that they'll understand how the person died? Well, let's say it was a suicide. Um, People have such a hard time accepting that someone they love could kill themselves. So I did my best to explain it. And people ask questions like, well, well, did he suffer? And one thing I learned from Dr. Hirsch is you never, ever lie to a family. If you lie just once, everything else you say is now suspect. So if someone said, did he suffer when he was shot in the head? I'd explain that for perhaps a microsecond or two, there may have been a terrible burning pain, but then instantly it was over, nearly instantly. So no, he didn't suffer. If it was a chest wound, yes. He may have had a, a period of, of almost 30 seconds or a minute of, of bleeding and feeling a, a severe, sharp pain in the chest. So... People can handle the truth because what they imagine is always so much worse. You were on duty. Well, I won't change that. You were you were not on duty when nine eleven occurred. You write about this at length in your book. Mm -hmm. um, you were you were nursing your uh, your injury uh, with <laughs> with your arm. <laughs> Oh, no, that was a surgery. That's right. That, that was, was a, oh, a surgery. Yeah, yeah, I had a surgery during nine eleven, so I was uh, I was out sick. Yeah, but I could, from reading your book, I could, from reading what you were going through at that time, you were so, it's so well described in your book, I could see a post-traumatic stress syndrome forming, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I, I, I was hesitating bringing it up, because what if I'm wrong? What if she says, no, no, I didn't suffer from PTSD? Well, I would be a liar. <laughs> are you I could, kidding I could, actually, I could actually see it forming though as you were writing it as you as you couldn't get down to the scene at first mm -hmm. um then when you got down to the scene i mean you let's face it it went from a city to a war zone in less than 24 yeah. hours yeah you know and and it stayed it stayed with not just you but a lot of the people in the office, thousands. Oh, thousands of people were so badly affected. Um, I'm quite fortunate in that I get uh, therapy through the World Trade Center uh, Health Fund uh, here in New York. And um, I'm in a PTSD group and a DBT group and all these groups for my mental, you know, <laughs> discombobulation. Um, 
and they do a great job with me. However, it never, ever leaves me. I can't walk down a city street without thinking, hmm, if that building were to fall, would I have a, a millisecond or even a second to get out of the way? And if so, which way should I go? Mm. Uh, I can't go into a movie theater without checking every exit, not just where it is, but does it work? I look to see if they padlock those exits because people do that, right? Oh, yeah. I am uh, uh, hypervigilant for danger, and I catastrophize everything, everything all day long. <laughs> I drive my partner crazy. I'm like, is the stove off? Or <laughs> did we check the batteries on the smoke alarms? Yes, last week. Okay, but- a whole week passed. <laughs> you know? So yes, I'm, I'm laughing, a but it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm a not. Mess. No, you're not. You're doing. I mean, you're doing great. You're doing fantastic. And well, um, writing the book really helped because oh, yeah. you know getting that out. And I, I'm not ashamed to admit I cried certain certain cases that I wrote about, and including 9/11. You know, I cried because all those feelings came back the horror and the, the tragedy and you know it was rough but at least i got it out right exactly and it was cathartic yeah is that definitely. the right use of the word cathartic? that's the word yeah 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 my public school education is haunting me you know so. <laughs> <laughs> i had the same one it's fine we and learned through the, the book of life right yes indeed and and you don't just i mean <clears throat> you don't just it uh, what happened to you with uh, with nine eleven? It almost took you down, didn't it? No yeah. pun intended there. I really don't want to make yeah. a pun. No, it really. Yeah, it did. It did. Um, uh, it was uh, it was a bad time mentally, emotionally. Um, you know, I had always been prone to depressions, but um, that was that was a killer one. That I really. Can yeah, it was a deadly depression. And I owe my current sanity, such as it is, to the miracle of modern medicine and some very, very good doctors. Um, like the doctor who said to me, uh, I said, I, I feel irrelevant now. I'm no longer in the game after my job was over. I said, uh, well, you know, who am I now? What am I doing that's important to the world? I feel like nobody. And he said, "We're not retirement is not the right concept for you. You really need another job. I said, who wants to hire me now? I cost too much. And all these eager young kids coming up, they'll do it for half the price. Um, and he said, so what did you want to do when you were a kid? What did you want to be that was impractical? Uh, I said, well, an actor or a writer. He said, so go ahead. You've got a pension now. You can afford to pay the rent. Go be an actor. Uh, go be a writer. Go do something. And I did. And you did. So, <laughs> I did. And also, um, we mentioned, I think in our pre-interview, we mentioned her, but she helped out uh, for when you were working. Um, Patricia Cornwell, the novelist, mm -hmm. she helped establish a foundation. Was it a foundation that she helped establish? It was a, a school. I got a grant um, from the National Institute of Justice to start the Forensic Science Academy at the New York City Office of Chief Medical Examiner. Um, and they gave us a, a substantial grant that we could bring in investigators from all over the country and give them the best possible training from the best possible teachers. Now, those teachers were, were volunteering. These are doctors, pathologists, toxicologists, anthropologists. And I said to Patricia, I can't, I can't afford to pay them. And she said, why don't I chip in on the school? And she said, I can give you a million dollars. Whoa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was like, wow. I mean, she really took our school up a notch, a big notch, uh, very, very generous to people in the forensic scientists, a great supporter. And, um, and when we did the, uh, the classes, you know, people would fly in for like a week or two weeks to take mm -hmm. all the courses. She would appear 
and have a cocktail party and sign books for them. And uh, the, I mean, these people were thrilled to see Patricia Cornwell. Um, it was it was really great, and uh, she was a wonderful supporter of the forensic sciences, and she still is. I mean, she's still yeah. uh, we're still in touch. We're still great friends, um, and she's one of those people that that shares the wealth, not just yeah. in her money, but in her experience and her, her advice. See that, and yeah, that that is incredible. That you don't meet too many people like that. Yeah, that's for sure. That's you for know. sure. What struck me also. Let's go back to the book for uh, for a moment. I want to talk about uh, again. I don't mean to be dwelling on nine eleven, but it does take up a, a a pretty good chunk of your book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was impressed with how many people were talking about the philanthropy of of Miss Cornwell, um, but also people who wanted, just wanted to help out after 9-11. Yeah. Um, sheriffs, deputy sheriffs, um, out-of-town uh, medical examiners who just happened to be in the city. Yeah. I mean, that that's, the thing you, that's something you don't hear about uh, when it comes to 9-11. That's right. That's something that was not really publicized. Um, you know, normally... Uh, when it comes to the professions like law enforcement, firefighting, uh, medical examiners, you don't especially want volunteers because there's a danger that unqualified people might, you know, join up to help you and then get hurt. And, you know, that happens. So there's a, there's a, you have to vet a volunteer. Well, we didn't hardly have to vet these folks at all because we knew who they were. They were medical examiners. They were coroners. They were funeral directors, um, uh, software engineers. And they came in and said, whatever we can do, we'll do it. People just poured into town, said, don't worry, I'll get my own hotel room. Or they slept with us on 30th Street, cots and tents and trailers. And Salvation and, Army Cafe or Sal's Cafe. Yeah, <laughs> Sal yeah, I love that. Boy, did I gain weight. Sal Sal <laughs> the, the Salvation Army put up a little shack. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, at first it was just a little shack and they served us some refreshments. And then they wound up building a shed and we could go in there and get dry socks and a sweatshirt and a good hot meal and a bag of candy. And boy, those bags of candy kept me going. <laughs> <laughs> the carbohydrates. So I probably gained 20 pounds that time. Um, but uh, just wonderful people came from all over the country and made a lot of good friends that were still close to this day. People from Oklahoma and California, Louisiana, um, and we all we all speak on nine eleven. We all call each other, so it's um it's it's quite a, a a brotherhood or a sisterhood of of just good people who wanted to do the right thing. Uh, what's next for for Barbara Butcher? Mm, well, a television show. Yeah, see, like <clears throat> the camera author. Hey, mm -hmm. we get. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um. Uh, the the option for my book uh, is out there, uh, and there's a lot of interest from <clears throat> different networks and uh, streamers. But in addition, um, I did do a show with Dick Wolf, the producer of Law and Order, FBI. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> he's got a new show coming out in the fall about, uh, uh, and it's an unscripted uh, true crime series. So I appear in about four episodes of that. And okay. it's uh, it's a really great show. I'm really excited about that. I don't have the title yet because they keep changing it. Um, but that'll probably be out in October. And then they, I've been contacted by the production company for Dick Wolf to say, let's do something else. Let's do another one. So, oh, my gosh. So my agent, uh, Gotham, out in L.A., they're working on this, the package. You know, I don't want to get involved in the business. Just tell me where yeah. to sign. You keep an eye on me make sure I don't do anything stupid <laughs> and then let me go out and work this stuff. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And uh, then there's a novel that I've got in my head based on a true case. And um, I've got the, the rough outline of it, but uh, it, it's a hard story to tell. 
it's a very yeah. hard story to tell, which I think will make it a good book. But what was it like being in front of the camera? Oh, I loved it. Oh my you god, did? I loved it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, on the advice of my psychiatrist, <laughs> I had <laughs> been taking acting lessons, and I met some great people. We had such a good time together, and so I became comfortable in front of a camera and on stage and. So, uh, you know, I love an audience, you know, I'll, go, I'll oh. go do anything. I'll go to the opening of a refrigerator and, you know, just to be out there. <laughs> so so I wasn't nervous or anything like that. Cause I would have been scared to death. No, no. Well, here you are. Are you scared? Yeah. No. <laughs> Only when I look at my face. You oh, know? Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> I keep seeing my mother and I go, what the hell? <laughs> Every time I look at myself. <laughs> I got to tell you, this has been so much fun. I've really enjoyed talking to you, Barbara. It's been, it's been a fun interview, and I want you back when your book, when your next book comes out, oh, or great. when the TV show, when we have a, when we have a date for the TV show. Oh, you got it. You got it back. definitely. Like, the, the author's name is Barbara Butcher. Yes, that's her real name. <laughs> yes. And <I'm, laughs> And the book is What the Dead Know, Learning About Life as a New York City Death Investigator. Barbara, thank you for being on Lights, Camera, Author with me. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>